You are listening to Keep Canada Weird, a weekly weird news roundup by The Nighttime Podcast. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to the weekly Keep Canada Weird discussion series. If you're new here in Keep Canada Weird, my pal handsome Aaron Airport and I seek out and explore the more offbeat Canadian news stories that caught our attention over the past week. In tonight's episode, which we recorded on the evening of March 5th, 2023, Aaron and I poured some red rose tea into our weirdest mugs in preparation for a wild night. We serve as judges in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland's ugliest, hottest man pageant. We choose sides in a snowy standoff that took place at a Tim Hortons in Hamilton, Ontario. We encourage grandmothers to fight back against scammers. And then we watch along helplessly as yet another shot is fired in the Canadian animal resistance. So let's get into it. Handsome friggin' Aaron Airport. (laughs) Oh my god. I'm on fire. I got a lot of of tea into me, so I may be a bit feisty tonight. But how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, buddy. How are you? Like I said, I've had a bunch of tea. I'm feeling a little feisty. I'm excited for this one. We got a we got a big night ahead of us here. Are you settled in? You're feeling good? I'm feeling good. I'm settled in. I'm ready to go. I'm not as feisty as you, though. I don't, I didn't have any tea today. You got to get caught up. Um, I don't know what it is, but your hair looks nice today. Did you do something? Uh, this old thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. It's grown out a little bit more than usual. I usually keep it very, very short because I'm bald on the top. So oh. uh, but I think it's just grown in a little bit. Um, I've had my winter hat on most of the day, so, so maybe, maybe that like kind of s- kept it in place. Stuck you know? it down. Uh, but yeah. could it be something different, like shampoo or conditioner? No, you, no, you, nothing. I'm setting please. you up. I'm setting no. you up. Did you use any different shampoo or conditioner in the last three days? No, I did not. You had to have. Did you bring your own? I washed my hair before I left for the weekend, so then okay. I did not wash my hair over the weekend. Okay, so people know what we're getting at. Let me ask you, how was your weekend? What's new? Tell me something. Ah, well, actually, I saw you on the weekend. You sure did. In person. Yes, Mm -hmm. I was your Airbnb guest. Yeah, you you were staying at my mom's house with my mom over the weekend, which is quite interesting, but I think you guys got along well. Yeah, yeah, except she stole my shampoo. Oh, but luckily you washed it before you went Before I left, so I did not get angry at her. Mm -hmm. And you were visiting Halifax. You had a bunch of errands to run. Any memorable moments you care to share on air? Memorable moments. Um, Not really. You know, the usual. Went to got some nice cocktails. Uh, Went to Lot 6. It's a really great cocktail bar in downtown Halifax. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, it had some great food and enjoyed the city, some shopping. And yeah, it was great. Well, that sounds amazing. Uh, my weekend, the only thing I, I think the only memorable thing I really did or, me, or worthy of mentioning thing I did was today I went to Value Village and what did I find on the shelf? But what I've been looking for for years, a nice big hammock that will hang between mm. trees. I have two trees in my backyard and I've always said like, I got to get a hammock for there. But I've never like taken it further than that to like see where to buy a hammock or Google it or go on Amazon. I was just like, someday I'll get a hammock. I'm at Value Village today. God himself sent down a hammock, put it on the rack, and I bought it. Yeah, yeah. Well, God had his storage unit cleared out, and <laughs> a hammock was there. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, yeah, and then it ended up in Value Village. And your hands, your very capable hammocky hands. <laughs> uh, we got a lot to get into. I'd love to sit and chat like this with you, but we got business to take care of. We have a mandate each week to keep Canada weird by finding, exploring, mm-hmm. and highlighting our country's weirdest and most wonderful stories. We're going to tackle that task tonight. And we, like I said, we got a full card of it to get into. But before we do, you want to catch up with an old friend? Old as, oh. in, <laughs> old yes. as in someone we met last week. Uh-huh. Um, That's old. And uh, this call is going to take us all the way back to Morocco. Uh, you remember um, uh, D period Marie? I certainly do. The uh, mysterious Tim Hortons Moroccan location. Mm-hmm. Well, D period Marie is giving us an update on the mysterious Tim Hortons, as well as highlighting an error that both of us made in uh, understanding her, um, her voicemail. 
you, you'll okay. hear what she has to say. What's I refuse that? to admit any errors, but I'll listen. This one is, is yeah, I think this one's on us. I'm going to own this one. Oh, Let's really? See. Okay. All right. Hello again, Jordan and Handsome Aaron Airport. This is D. Period Marie back with you here live from Morocco. I would have introduced myself as D. Marie, but that is okay. No problem. Calm down. Guys, you didn't disappoint me in your response uh, to my Tim Hortons Casablanca mystery. So thank you so much. And I was thrilled to hear my, my voice message on the podcast. That was awesome. But... Aaron Airport, man, I have a bone to pick with you. No, you don't. I didn't go to the Tim Hortons because I wanted Tim Hortons over a local coffee shop. I went there specifically, like I said, so I could gather intel for you guys specifically. Mm -hmm. When I saw the Tim Hortons on the Google map, you guys were the ones that came to mind, the nighttime podcast, and I headed to that Tim Hortons specifically with the goal of providing you with intel and fodder for your ongoing discussion of Tim Hortons and their business practices, what have you. What I do have to say, though, is in addition to going to the Tim Hortons with the specific goal in mind of gathering intel for the nighttime podcast and the Keep Canada Weird segment, was I wanted to test them. I wanted to test Tim Hortons Casablanca. I wanted to go in there and I wanted to order a double double. I wanted to see if they understood double double and I would know right away. If they don't understand double double, forget it. This is, you know, this is a failure here in Morocco. They have to get this lingo. Thanks again, guys. I hope you both keep well. Take care. I'm going to keep listening, keep being great. And keep Canada weird. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but no, I do remember in her original voicemail, she thought of us when she saw on the map, she did uh, on the Google yeah. map, she did think of us. So I will own that. If someone is going to work for us abroad, I'll, uh, yeah. I'll take our mistakes on the chin. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why the impression I got from the original voicemail was that we were more of a side note of, oh, I'm going to go to Tim Hortons in Morocco or whatever. And I'll also, while I'm there, I'll, I'll be a, a keep Canada weird spy. But, but that felt like more of a side piece as opposed mm -hmm. to the main reason she was going there was to get Tim Hortons coffee. So, so I thought, so I, I, I'm not going to apologize. Uh, I didn't do anything wrong. I, I misinterpreted, but yeah, no, actually, apologize. Yeah. let's just own it. That's, no, I refuse to own this. No, I refuse to own this. No. <laughs> okay. You I can will. own it if you want. I'm not going to own it. No, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't do anything. You pissed Aaron off. I'll own it. D period, Marie, you're cool with me. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and yeah. I appreciate these messages from abroad. Um, yes, we both do. We both appreciate the messages and keep them coming. And yeah, I, I love how she always signs off with Keep Canada Weird. So I really appreciate that. Well, that was great to hear. Thank you, Deep here, Marie. But let's get to the stories. We got a full one. We're going to hear how Cornerbrook, Newfoundland's hottest man got ugly. We're going to hear about a snowy standoff at a Tim Hortons. We're going to hear about a grandmother fighting back about grandmother scammers. And then we're going to hear another chilling deer attack story. Mm. Aaron, I just gave them in a specific order, but we don't got to do it that way. Where do you want to start with this mess? Listen, I want you to start where you want to start. You're okay. let's let's do it. You, I, you you direct me. I can't wait. We got to get into Cornerbrook's hottest man getting ugly. That's what I was thinking. The, the headline that uh, the CBC covered this. The headline that they gave their article was uh, Cornerbrook's hottest man becomes Cornerbrook's hottest mess. I think mm -hmm. is how they put it. Uh, it. This story revolves around a hottest man competition in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland, but it's, they call it the hottest man, but it doesn't seem to be just a, like a beauty pageant sort of thing. It's also like kind of mixed with like talent show and onstage performance. Um, they do it once a year by the sounds of it in Cornerbrook and this year's got especially ugly, but let me tell you about how Cornerbrook's hottest man competition got ugly. I'm going to read, uh, excerpts from the recent CBC article I mentioned. 
So it says, Corner Brook's hottest man in the coldest season contest is a pageant-like competition where men have a chance to heat up the stage with witty jokes or inflame passions with flashy outfits. But one contestant said the evening's mood quickly turned cold when one inebriated competitor continually made misogynistic and homophobic content, uh, comments to other performers backstage. The Hottest Man Contest, which took place at the Palace Nightclub in Cornerbrook last Thursday, is part of the city's Winter Carnival, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. When Daniel Tucker of Cornerbrook found out he'd been anonymously nominated to partake in the competition, he says he was initially hesitant to perform, but also excited at the opportunity. Tucker, who identifies as gay, says he's never felt like he fit in with social expectations of manliness or masculinity. He says he wanted to use this performance to push boundaries and to challenge people's perceptions of what's considered masculine. But at the event, he says, one of his fellow competitors was very intoxicated and began making homophobic jokes and comments to performers backstage. He says the contestant whispered in his ear numerous times saying things like, that guy sounds gay, about other competitors and making misogynistic comments about the night's musical, female musical performer. Tucker says many people were aware of that the, con that the contestant was very intoxicated. Although one of the carnival organizers spoke to the contestant briefly and told him to behave, Tucker says the man continued drinking throughout the night and that alcoholic beverages were never taken out of his hands, nor was he asked to leave. Tucker also says he's proud to be 11 months sober, but that contestants weren't provided with anything to drink backstage other than alcohol. Tucker says he wrote a letter to carnival organizers, one part of it reading, as a gay man, I feel out of place and othered. At times I feel unsafe and uncomfortable. And as a sober man, I felt like I felt like less than an afterthought of the event. Donna Luther of Cornerbrook's Winter Carnival Committee declined an interview request, but provided an email statement saying in part, the board of Winter Carnival Inc. will be contacting Daniel Tucker to arrange a meeting so we can discuss his concerns to determine if there's anything that the carnival need do in the future. We'll, and we will appreciate its input. Mm -hmm. So sounds like a, this event, my, my initial thought is it seems like they're walking a fine line between like a respectable kind of pageant sort of event and like a wild night at a nightclub. They host it at a bar giving drinks to everybody. I feel like they're kind of, I wouldn't say they're asking for this kind of trouble, but I'm not surprised it turned ugly. Yeah, I guess. Um, I would have to see the event though. Like I would have to be there to kind of get the vibe of the event or maybe in previous years or mm -hmm whatever the situation is but certainly it sounds like once this once this contestant was determined to be inebriated and, and making uh homophobic comments they yes. should have just get out of yeah, yeah just, you're, you're done why give them a second chance why let them hang around why let it continue to, and snowball mm -hmm. when they could just get rid of them yeah absolutely you know, send them home call them a cab get them out of there and move on with the competition yeah. And the other thing with this competition, although I said it, it's like it's hosted at a nightclub uh, and, you know, there's they're offered drinks and such. Um, this isn't something that's run by the nightclub. It's run by like a, a committee and seems to be associated with the town of Cornerbrook because it's a part of their like winter celebration. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, you know, if it was something hosted by a nightclub. I could see them having a longer leash for how you know drunk or how much how much you could have drank and stuff like that but something hosted by like a talent hottest man kind of competition hosted by something connected with like a civic event they need to have a way better way to manage this because it's a black eye for everybody involved and if it gets to the point that you know that this guy had to hear any of this stuff of course is awful and wrong but it's to the mm -hmm. point that it's like he has to also endure the media coverage of it by going public with his story. Yeah, exactly. It just it sounds like it should have it was just handled poorly behind the scenes. And uh, it's just yeah, it's it's a black eye and it's something that uh, I mean, uh, hottest man competition. I don't know. Like it's, it's I find those events. Uh, I, I don't know what to think of them, I guess. Hmm. I don't know what to think of those events. I had the hottest anything, you know, hottest whatever. Cup of coffee. No. Yeah, thing. yeah. A cup of coffee I can get behind, you know, the hottest cup or the hottest cup of tea in your case that you mm -hmm. had today. Mm -hmm. um, anything that, I mean, I know it's maybe some of it's talent based, maybe some of it's personality based, but pageants like that and, and events like that, just I have no interest in them. 
and I would lose them if I partook. <laughs> I'll give yourself some credit. No, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do well. I don't think. But uh, why are these even still happening? I guess maybe, maybe I need again. I feel like I need to see this in action. This this mm-hmm. particular competition. Are you fishing for an invite from the Cornerbrook hottest man during the coldest season committee? Yeah, next, next year I, I will go. We'll both go. That would be amazing. That's right. We should do research for next year's competition. You'll enter. I'll be a judge. Mm-hmm. I will vote you lowest on the list. Least hottest man. Uh, <laughs> the coldest his, man. His t-shirts are too black, I'll say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, regardless, uh, the man involved in the story, Daniel Taylor, uh, I'm a heterosexual man, but I looked at his Facebook profile to kind of see. I've I've read online that he was talking about this and sharing screenshots of conversations and stuff. I had to see that because I'm a sucker for drama. Uh, he's a good looking guy. So I'm going to just say right now, Keep Canada Weird just had a Cornerbrook's Hottest Man competition and he just won. I agree. I haven't seen the pictures, but it it sounds hot. Let's get into Tim Hortons a little bit, all right? As we usually do, yes. And, <laughs> and this worked out well because this week we ended up, for most of the stories that we've selected, we also have just, by coincidence, a voice memo that from a listener that somehow ties into it. So I'm going to play a voice memo we received, and I'll be doing this throughout the night, but I'm going to play a voice memo we received, and then we'll get to the main story. Here's okay. what we got. Hey, Jordan. Um, just for your Keep Canada Weird segment. I don't know uh, if you've heard or seen, but I just read the, an article on the CBC News saying that uh, there was some eviction notices served to a couple off tenants uh, in some apartments in PEI. The people that were uh, served the eviction notices were served eviction notices by their landlord who opens, who happens to own uh, Tim Hortons franchisees in PEI. And so anyway, I know that you're not a big fan. You were airing off uh, Tim Hortons and now there's Uh, Tim Horton's franchisee that was trying to kick out uh, a couple of uh, tenants and properties he owned. So that way he could uh, get some uh, foreign workers in there to to work at his coffee shops. I'm going to cut it there because he eventually gives uh, his contact info. But um, okay, (laughs) this story, I don't know. Which Tim Horton's would like. Yeah, uh, they they call him up right away. (laughs) Mm, What'd you say about us? (laughs) For people who don't know the story, actually, I had this on on my list of one of the things we may cover tonight, but then I got this voicemail and I'm like, oh, we'll just let him tell the story. But basically, yeah. we don't need to get deep into it. But what story, what what happened is a franchise owner like that owns multiple Tim Hortons locations in, I believe, Surrey, Prince Edward Island. Mm-hmm. Um, they utilize temporary foreign workers, which is like bringing in people from out of the country to work at the Tim Hortons locations for, you know, short periods of time on these temporary work assignments. Uh, But of course, anyone listening to this from Canada and maybe other parts of the world as well, we're facing a housing crisis. It's very hard to get um, affordable housing in Nova Scotia and PEI as well. So this Tim Horton's franchise owner who was bringing in these foreign workers was having a hard time finding housing for them. So what he tried to do was he actually owned apartment buildings as well. He tried to evict all the tenants of one of his apartment buildings um, to have his temporary foreign workers for the Tim Horton's restaurants stay in the building instead of his um, his current tenants. Uh, the tenants rose up and fight, fought, uh, fought the evictions. It actually went to court or whatever the equivalent is with the tenancy board and the uh the current tenants won so he is not going to be allowed to do this no so. no and good for the tenants for for battling that and oh, winning yeah. and it's it's kind of a weird story in the sense that we're the first ones first in line to to attack tim hortons on anything that they might do any 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 line that they may cross where that we're the first ones there to to Mm -hmm. shine a light on that Mm -hmm. so what this is a franchise owner so this is someone who's not you know this decision is not coming from head office of tim hortons you know this decision is coming from somebody specific in pei who owns a few locations a few uh restaurants Mm -hmm. and is doing this on their own accord yep so a little different than what we're normally into that's right so we we can't really 
attack all of Tim Hortons over this, but certainly I, I, I'm curious to 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 think about what Tim Hortons has to say about it when they hear one of their franchise owners in PEI is, is tried to do this. I'm sure they don't like their name in the news associated with evicting tenants in the middle of a housing crisis. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, not cool. But that's not our main story. That was a voice memo, but let's get to the main story related to Tim Hortons. Uh, I, I'm calling this story a snowy, a snowy standoff at Tim Hortons. This takes place in Hamilton, Ontario, and involves a snowy mess at the drive-thru. Listen to this. Mm. A local TikToker found himself in the middle of a snow fight while stuck in a Tim Hortons drive-thru. He told CHCH News that while he was getting his morning coffee, a bobcat dumped two piles of snow at the beginning and end of the drive-thru. Adam Atkinson has the story. Oh, yo, I'm in the Tim Hortons drive-thru. TikToker Michael Finch found himself caught right in the middle of a snow fight Tuesday morning. I pulled into the drive-thru and I ordered my coffee at Tim Hortons. And as I approached the window, there was a pile of snow there. A second vehicle pulled in behind me. That driver told Michael Finch that a guy on a bobcat just dumped a pile of snow at the beginning of the Tim Hortons drive-thru as well. Trapped between two mountains of snow, Michael Finch got out and decided to TikTok about his predicament and then find out what's going on. And they let me know that there was a conflict between the maintenance plow crew and then the neighbor next door because they had damaged the fence. No one wanted to pay for it. The owner of this Tim Hortons at Upper James and Airport Road wouldn't go on camera today, but explained to CHCH News what happened. He acknowledged this fence was damaged, but said Tim Hortons doesn't have anything to do with snow removal on the property. He's just renting space in the building. He says that around 6.30 yesterday morning, a worker at this construction site took it upon himself to get revenge for the fence and dump the two loads of snow on the drive through trapping two cars. In the spirit of the moment, because I was on my way to work, I had 20 minutes to be there. I was like, I was mad. But after finding out the full story, I find it pretty amusing as well. Michael Finch says he hopped this curb with his car once he realized he wasn't getting around the mountains of snow. He doesn't know what the car behind him did, but he heard from staff at the Tim Hortons later on that it took a couple of hours for the piles of snow to be removed. I got my coffee, I made my video, and then I decided, oh, I'm going to try to pick this curb out. First, I got stuck, and then I just backed up and got some snow. When it comes to picking sides in this snow fight, Michael Finch isn't on the fence at all. Well, at this point in time, I'm on the guy next door's side. More or less, his fence got broke. No one wants to pay for the repairs. It was... <laughs> I'd say it was a little childish, but at the same time, it was a uh, pretty funny revenge. No one got hurt. The Timmy's owner is still pretty upset because he had to close his business for at least an hour that morning. We reached out to Sonoma Homes and were told they didn't know about the incident. Oh, I love it. I love it. The only problem I see with it, though, is like it, the neighbor's people wanted to get revenge on like the owner of Tim Hortons. Could they not have waited for a time that the drive through was clear and then just put all the snow there, making Tim Hortons need to like kind of, you know, lose business for a couple hours, trapping these, well, luckily they trapped a kind of funny, lighthearted guy in the drive through mm -hmm. but that was, that was the dirty part, I think, is trapping the poor people in there. But if they didn't, if they didn't do it where one or two cars were trapped in there, it wouldn't have gotten any attention. That's a good point. So if they're going to, if they're going to send a message, they absolutely have to do it when one or two people are trapped. Yeah, in that's what gets this on the news. And that's what gets it on this podcast. Yeah, yeah. That's what got it on TikTok. I remember seeing the TikTok when it came out. And yeah, I'm 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 fully supportive of of the neighbors, you know. I'm sure uh, Tim Hortons isn't easy to deal with when they're at fault for something, you know, uh, damage of a fence or whatever the situation yeah, well, is. Well, I, I, I can and, hear the rigmarole. You call, you go into Tim Hortons and you say like, yeah, you guys, someone, you know, associated with your business broke my fence. And they're like, well, actually mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm the manager, the, the owner, I'll give you the owner's info. And then you call the owner and the owner's like, well, I just rent the space there. Someone else deals with the snow removal. And it's, it's like, yeah. it's like forget it. I'm just, Oh, it's just uh, the blame is being passed just all the way up the snow. chain until it eventually dissolves and there's nobody you can talk to anymore. Yeah. So there's there's times in, in your life where you're like, well, you know what? I got to do something to kind of draw attention to this. So I'm going to trap people in the drive-thru with piles of snow. <laughs> and 
And, and I think the more people you prevent from consuming Tim Hortons this way, the yeah, better. Maybe this is know. a bit of a public service. How many people maybe tried to access the drive through uh, who weren't trapped in but wanted to go through Tim Hortons and were like, oh, there's piles of snow there. I'm going to go to Robbins or McDonald's. Yeah, they go to Robbins and they're like, I haven't had this stuff before, but I need something and I can't get into Tim's. They go to Robbins and like. And then they realize, oh, this coffee is way, way better than Tim Hortons. So why would I ever go to Tim Hortons again? Oh, so it's almost sort of like a vigilante version of activism mixed with a revenge story. They should make a movie about this incident. Yeah, I think they should. I mean, it's not often that we encourage people to take the law into their own hands. We're not However, we're not encouraging people to do this. But no, but if no, someone no. else does it, it's okay to celebrate them. I celebrate it and you know, in the summertime you can't get away with something like this because there is no snow. Hmm. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know what point I'm trying to make there, but what I am saying is that there's no snow in the summer. Uh, yeah, you're right. This reminds, I don't know the whole story, but this reminds me of something that happened in our hometown. I don't know if you're aware of this, but there was a Tim Hortons. No, sorry. It was a Wendy's restaurant that was next door to like a Nova Scotia liquor commission, which is on Welton street in Sydney, Aaron, I'm talking about, but um, mm -hmm. there was some kind of dispute about the land uh, where, where the property. Yeah. Lines. That's really, that's a really kind of confusing who, where the land, where the property ends and begins. Yeah. yeah there was this kind of like dispute about where the property line was. So what NSLC, the neighboring business to the Wendy's did is they believed that their property line was, in the middle of Wendy's drive through So they installed like these big massive metal posts, like just in the center of Wendy's drive through So Wendy's had to close the drive through for literally like, it took like months and then they mm -hmm. changed something and now it's open again. But it was just, uh, it was that was kind of like an extreme version of this. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's kind of hard to drive through big concrete posts. Or, or big piles of snow. Mm -hmm. Well, you can kind of ram piles of snow a couple times and get over there depending on your vehicle uh let's get into the next one here this is going to be we've talked about scams a lot last week we, we did the gift card mm -hmm. scams we've done the grandmother scam in the past and that the grandmother scam is when somebody calls an old lady or an old man and say i'm your grandchild i'm in legal trouble i need your help you know uh uh, someone's going to come, a bail bondsman's going to come to your house and you got to give them $5,000 in cash and they're going to let me out, grandma, please do it. So that's yeah. the grandmother or the grandparent scam. It's one you've tried to pull on me and you of will times. never fall for it. L listen to this voice. Keep trying though. I'll no, keep trying. <laughs> I don't know. Listen yeah. to this voicemail because again, this ties in with unrelated to us choosing to do a story about this. Here's the voicemail I got this week. Hi there, how you doing today, bud? Well, the reason why I'm messaging you guys is because I'm from Cape Breton. Well, no way. Um, <laughs> my grandmother was just recently scammed from the grandparents scam. They got her for ten thousand uh, dollars. It's sad. Oh. It's, it's really sad. She's 81 years old. They call her up, give the spiel that her grandson was in jail. Blah 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 blah. They went to the door, pick up the ten grand cash. But the thing of it is, though. I got phone numbers, I got addresses and stuff, right? And the cops aren't doing nothing about it. It's like, it's, it's sad because it's just happening here in Cape Breton. Like, it's, it's sad, man. And I end that because he also gives some contact info. According to him, yeah. first, I just want to hear his voice one more time. I love that he has to tell us he's from Cape Breton when he starts his message like this. Hi there, how you doing today, bud? Well, the <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to say where you're from, dude. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, but yeah. according to him, he has info on on who these people are i'm kind of questioning should i contact this guy and see how you know what, what i can do with that i think it's best left to the police because all i'll do is uh you'll just make I'll, it worse I'll just bother everybody um but <laughs> yeah the police will beg you to stay yeah, out but of i it. didn't see anything about this case in the news in cape breton so i don't know what the no, story me is either, no but so this this is a crime that happens all over, probably all over the world, but certainly all over Canada. It's in the news a lot. Yeah. But the reason we're talking about it tonight is uh, a grandmother fought back in Windsor. Listen to this. 
Some good news out of Windsor Police Headquarters tonight as the force held a news conference to thank a local senior for thwarting an attempt at a grandparent scam. Travis Fortnum joins me now with the details. Travis, we have been hearing so much about these scams. Yeah, Stephanie, Windsor Police say they've seen about a dozen grandparent scams reported in the last month alone. Today, it would seem scammers picked the wrong local grandma to try and dupe. I said, who is this? And he said, it's, come on, it's your grandson. For context, the grandparent scam sees fraudsters cold call seniors pretending to be their beloved grandchild in need of money, usually to sort out some type of legal trouble. Windsor's Bonnie Bednarik says it's the third time scammers tried her number, so she stalled for time and called Windsor police who came and staked out her house waiting for the scammers to arrive. Two people were arrested and in their vehicle, officers found cash from two other suspected victims. Bednarik says she's thrilled to have helped. You call the police, you call your family. Do not give money to anybody you don't know. And my goal of being here today is to make Windsor the city that fraudsters don't want to come to. I want all our seniors to be vigilant and to not give money to strangers. Windsor police say despite two alleged scammers being caught, there are still more fraudsters out there targeting seniors. They want folks to learn from Bednarik, ask questions, contact the grandchild the caller claims to be, and contact police. That, that crime bothers me because I, I know what well, bothers me more than other scams because it's targeting the elderly. And when I hear it, I think my grandmother would totally fall for that. Her hearing's bad and she's all like easily mm -hmm. confused. In the modern world, like when you hear these things, like I'm going to send someone to pick up money, we as someone who navigate the modern world all the time, we know like, oh, that sounds crazy. But yeah, anytime anybody calls you looking for money, looking for personal information like it's it's yeah like it's it's obvious to us not mm -hmm. to give them anything or not to entertain the idea yeah, at but all for a but, scene like when i talk to my grandmother everything is like wild to her and nothing makes any mm -hmm. sense so this would make as much sense as any other thing she has to do well they come from a generation where anything that happens over the phone is legitimate mm -hmm. like anytime somebody called you uh it was for something real mm -hmm. Um, what do you think of grandma uh, having the wherewithal to know what was happening, involving the police, and ultimately like serving herself up as bait almost, having them come to the house to get arrested? Yeah, yeah. It would have been interesting to have a video of that mm -hmm. just to kind of see like how much contact was she going to have with them? You know, they were going to come right up to their to her door and was she going to talk to them at all or where the police is going to be right there to get well, them yeah well I'm, I'm curious to see like how they play yeah i out. thought about that and i'm thinking if if you were a cop trying to build like a, a a rock solid criminal case against these people it would be good to have her actually answer the door and get them to prove like get them to show well yeah you usually have to have the exchange mm -hmm. happen uh, so yes, well, okay, well, you know, where's the money? Here's the money. You know, and once they have the money in their hands, then they can arrest them. Throw them to the ground. So I'm wondering how deep she had to go into this for them to be legally able to make mm -hmm. the arrest. Uh, and then I wonder if she did she did it at her own house or if the police said, you know, here's a place we're going to put you. Because then I'm sure if I was her or if I was her grandkids, I would be like, not nanny. I don't want like these criminals knowing where you live and getting busted yeah i would give them a different address or something i'm sure there's probably like a safe house a way they could do it yeah and i mean that's the way to do it you know when they call you want these people to get arrested yeah. so you have to play along up to the point but it's it's educating people on on what are scams yeah. you know and what aren't mm -hmm. and getting the word out there that if somebody calls you looking for money that you can't uh accept it you can't go along yeah. with the, it. the thing you got to learn about the modern world i think for a lot of people is any like legitimate business they're cutting so many costs and corners that no business like has the time to call anyone anymore you never get calls from like a legitimate no, business no no i don't know how you even communicate with them i guess through i don't even know so many scams so many of these telephone scams are coming from different countries mm -hmm. so it's really hard jurisdiction wise for uh the police to really do anything about it because i know i've called like when those scams started happening in the earlier days 
and we call the police, they'd be like, there's nothing you can do. You know, they call saying there's something wrong with your computer and blah, blah, blah. Uh, go on and log in and give me the passwords for this and that, and I'll fix it up or yeah. whatever. And, and then we call and say, yeah, there's nothing we can do mm -hmm. to say you don't have a computer and move yeah. on. But with the grandparents scam is different though, because that involves a physical person showing That's the up. Thing that's so different yeah. about this one. Yeah. Like they're, cold calling random elderly people pretending to be relatives and they're sh physically showing up to their address to get mm -hmm. money but that's what, ma what ma makes it possible to bust them is unlike that's what that is so yeah, like yeah, this exactly. faraway voice from another country that's disguising their phone number to look local this is like an actual criminal in your town or in your province that's driving to your grandmother's house to collect the money um and if your grandmother or this old lady is a older lady is aware of what's happening and can serve themselves up as bait yeah i'm down with that as long as everyone's safe yeah yeah again that's why i'd like to see how it was done or at least hear about how they did yeah, and i'm sure it's how how much how involved was she in in how how much of an exchange had to be made mm -hmm. yeah it would be interesting and i'm sure if the police were involved in setting it up they why wouldn't they have filmed it i'm sure i get why they wouldn't have released it to the news but maybe at a yeah but they definitely filmed it i i would why assume wouldn't they yeah hmm. yeah if they're gonna present it in court they're gonna want to have everything on yeah. videotape and when you're busting a situation like this uh, it's, it's pretty easy to film it. Um, this scam must work because in Google, if you Google grandparents scam, you'll find story after story of people falling for it and then going to the news to raise awareness that like this happened to me and it could happen to you. Uh, I, it shocks me that it's successful to the extent it is. And even in this case that we just heard when they arrested these people for showing up at our house to collect the money, they had money from what they suspected were two other successful scams that they did to other yeah, people so yeah. man wild but it's just brutal to hear about it yeah though. it it's is just it just is terrible to hear about uh people targeting the elderly in scams like this like and it's still happening and, and it's and it's happening a lot let's move on to our last segment so for people who follow the Keep Canada Weird series, it's no secret that we believe we've uncovered something serious happening in Canada that involves animals, specifically deer, moose, and caribou, and cows, I suppose. Um, it's every animal. It seems to be every it's animal. Every animal. Yeah. yeah, and there, mm -hmm. there's something going on. They're rising up in some it's way. It's safe to say anything on four legs is an issue. Is, is coming um, for us so last week we t we told the story of a police officer who while on duty got out of his vehicle because he saw a caribou he wanted to shoot and kill the caribou and hunt it he ended up missing the caribou and struck his own vehicle his own cruiser and he ended up uh, losing his job as a cop as a result of it uh, we talked a lot about what this guy was thinking and I, we may have dabbled a little bit in the uh, animal rise up uh, in that discussion but we have a listener who called in from all the way i guess down into the side he's in las vegas that'd be ah, okay. far away he called in from far away he had a a different take on what may have happened with that officer. Here's what he had to say. This is Norm. Hi, Jordan and Aaron. This is Norm from Vegas. I was just listening to your most recent episode of Keep Canada Weird. And just as a preliminary comment, I would like to say I'm glad that handsome Aaron Airport decided to stay with the show. I think he's great. Also, because I think that Randy guy is kind of creepy. That's not <laughs> what I called him out. I called about the caribou incident. I understand how Jordan would have missed this, but I'm surprised that Aaron did. It's clearly a conspiracy with the cows and the deers, and now the caribou are getting involved. I believe what happened here is that the RCMP or Canadian patrolman was investigating a disturbance possibly caused by other caribou he took his service rifle, went to investigate, and then another caribou came to block his path back to his vehicle. 
Now, what was he to do under these circumstances? It's possible that the caribou even put a suggestion into his mind to shoot it and then jumped out of the way, knowing that it would destroy his vehicle and end his career. I love the show. Interesting. Eh? Say this cop is aware of what's happening with animals and maybe the higher ups within law enforcement aren't. And this cop decides to take it into his own hands. In the middle of whatever he was doing, he ends up shooting his car. He has a choice of, I tell my boss, the animals are rising up in Canada. I saw the opportunity to take one out. I tried, I missed, shot my car. Mm -hmm. Or just come up with a, a probably a more believable episode, uh, more believable explanation involving hunting. Um, what do you think of Norm's take? Do you think you got this right? Listen, uh, it wasn't that I missed this, Norm. I just want to speak directly to okay. Norm right now. Uh, what you're what you're saying is 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 uh, there's a lot of moving pieces here, and there's a lot of um, uh, things that we don't understand right now. Um, so, I, 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 off the record, you know, we can talk more about this, Norm. I think that we should uh, move off the show to talk mm -hmm. about it. Uh, I just can't speak of the animal uprising right now or or to, to say that that's what this was or wasn't. Um, there's a lot happening, and I, I just don't want to. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned for my own safety right mm -hmm. now. Uh, my cat's been meowing throughout this entire episode. I'm worried what he might do to me. Um, again, I just want to say to my animal overlords, uh, I accept and submit to you. And I'm on your side and uh, please use me as a mouthpiece for your cause. Mm -hmm. I will do whatever you want. Um, and, uh, and Norm, I would say, you know, run. <laughs> All right. Well, Aaron, I know this is a big deal for you and you're worried about this. This next story related somewhat to Norm's voicemail is not going to put you at ease. I named this section of the episode, the animal uprising is moving east. Oh, this no. involves another deer attack. This one taking place very uh, at our next door neighbor of a province, New Brunswick. Listen to this. It's not unusual for us to see deer, you know, come out, but they normally don't run into the house. <laughs> <laughs> the tracks are there coming over and uh, Went through this by this bush and come right in here, this area here of the window. And uh, when we got it out, that's the way it left, right there, the tracks area. These things are heavy, and they went through, through two of them, like it was doubled, eh? Surprised it could make it through those windows? Yeah, I'm surprised it didn't break his neck, something like that. When I when I come in and see the deer, it was over in the corner by the stove. And uh, as soon as I seen it, I didn't stay around. I, uh, I knew I had to get the forestry people. So that's exactly what I did. And they come down and he, the guy, yeah, he knew what he was doing. So he got the deer out with the big stick. And went from here into the bathroom. Then he had to get it out of there. And up, and up the upstairs. The forestry, uh, they were surprised. Uh, so it doesn't normally happen, but, uh, but uh, like I say, the guy knew what he was doing. Uh, well, I'm going to do three clips together. It made a mess and left a lot. So to anyone who, who could only hear and not see that um, news broadcast, the deer seemed to bust in to this home, to this gentleman's home, through a double-paned window that led into like what looked like kind of like a basement living room so it's a pretty large window that the deer must have just whether it slipped or intentionally tried to get in this man's house while he slept the deer got in there and when he finally found it it's like in his living room just standing there next to his wood stove and mm -hmm. uh, this guy i think he did the right thing by getting out of the house and calling whatever the forestry people are and they came and dealt with it yeah, it's interesting that the deer had no problem getting through the window, but then 
a small broom <laughs> is the thing that it was scared the most yeah. of. And, and he was able to shoo it away with the well, broom. It, it, they say he did it with a stick. The, it, we could see a broom in the newscast. But he was also sliding a uh, the, the forestry guy who was coaxing the deer out of the house. He was also using a large couch. He would like kind of use the stick to get the deer. Yeah, he was then blocking he it off. Kept blocking couch. its direction and until mm -hmm. the deer had no choice but to run up a set of stairs. It was pretty awkward to see a deer running upstairs. It's it's a little uncomfortable to watch. It seems like the deer is terrified and it's and it's and uh, yeah, it's falling all over the place and it, mm. it seems quite uh, unhinged. Well, but... a floor uh, inside your home would be pretty slippery for a deer on hooks. Yeah, yeah. I remember my grandmother's dog. She had a large black lab named Sam and there was uh, one section of the house he wouldn't go in ever because when he was a smaller dog, it was it was a section of the house that had hardwood floors. But when he was a smaller dog, he would slip. So he'd like walk in that room and he'd slip and slide under the, into the couch or slide into the wall or something when he was excited and running around. Mm. And because of that, he's just like, he just wouldn't go down where the floor was because it was too slippery. A deer's paws would probably wouldn't be too dissimilar from a, a dog's, I guess. I, I could see it slipping all over the place, but I feel bad for that deer. If it was an innocent deer uninvolved in what's going on across the rest of Canada with animals, I feel horrible for him. If the deer had malicious intent going into this man's house, I think that man's fortunate to get out of that with his life. Because if you're alone in a room with a deer and you have to take them on, that's a tough fight. Yeah, I'm going to Home Depot and I'm buying all the brooms and I'm bringing them to my house and I'm going to have those uh, for when the uprising officially hits You could us. use it like garlic and um, just put them all around the yard. Like garlic, yeah, yeah. I don't know. You know, watching the uh, the deer slip and slide on the floor there, I, I, I also struggled uh, uh, at your mom's place on the weekend. Oh, what was slippery? Her stairs. Are you serious? They are wood hardwood stairs. Um, they are a hardwood stair, and I was I slipped a number of times going down. <laughs> okay, but no one got it. So, you didn't get hurt. Uh, well, you'll you'll get a letter from. Oh, really? uh, I can't wait to tell my mom because there's a story behind that. I think she used the wrong cleaner one time, and this, mm -hmm. and then she had to like use strong cleaner to remove the inappropriate cleaner that made her stairs slippery. Uh, I'm going to have her install runners before you visit again. It, she could use a runner. And just yeah, like yeah. Thomas says in the chat, people, please put runner carpets on your hardwood floors so that visiting deer can walk around easily. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, this is this is all part, you know, I, I again, I submit to the animal overlords. I, I, I will have brooms on me to protect myself, but um, I'm hoping that uh, it's not going to come to that. But yeah. Um, this is all part of it. We're seeing it every week. We're seeing this every week. The animals are coming to take back what is theirs. And I'd say we've got probably six months before we're no longer. Wow. Um, that's a pretty dark note to end this episode on. Mm -hmm. But well, it's a serious topic. And if we get into stuff like that, people are going to have to accept uh, some darkness. No, people come here for the truth and the, and the truth is furry and angry and covered in fleas and uh, looking to smash through your window and uh, fall all over your floors. Well, why don't we make that the way we wrap this episode up? Let's do it. Let's wrap it up. Aaron, until next time. Jordan, until next time. Keep an eye on your cat. Ken Tiggs is up to something serious. Ken Tiggs has been meowing through this. I've been I've been gone all weekend, so and I came home, came right up the stairs and started recording, and my cat has just been meowing at me this entire time. I want to thank you for helping Aaron and I meet our mandate to keep Canada weird. But let us also call out to you for even greater support in this mission. If something unusual happened in your town, or if you want to weigh in on a story we've covered on the show get in touch. And the best way to do it is by sending a voice memo at nighttimepodcast.com slash contact. We hope to hear from you. Now, I'm going to start wrapping this episode up, but before I do, let me give thanks. First, a big thanks to Aaron for sharing an evening with me and with you, the listeners of Nighttime. A big shout out to the internet's favorite cult leader, Unicole, who provides this series intro and outro voiceovers. 
And lastly, but most importantly, a massive thank you goes out to every one of you listening to Nighttime. As without your interest and your support, this show would be as pointless as it would be impossible. And on the topic of support, let me thank the newest subscribers to the Nighttime Podcast premium feed. Tanya, Heidi, and Don, thank you for your generous support. And for anyone else who'd like to support the show, you can help fund the creation of the show by subscribing to the premium feed or spread word of the show by sharing this episode on social media and letting like-minded friends know what we're doing here. If you have any story ideas, if you want to give feedback on the show or contribute a voice memo to be aired and responded to in an upcoming episode, you can do all that and more at nighttimepodcast.com. Aaron and I would love to hear from you. But until then, take care of each other, hug your loved ones tight, and let us know if you see anything weird. The Nighttime Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Jordan Bonaparte. Copyright Jordan Bonaparte. Keep Canada weird. Thank you.